Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're noticing with some of the speakers that you've probably got questions and uh, that you may need answering. If you fire them towards our Twitter, we'll answer them that way, if that's okay. And if still don't, don't get the answer, email us and we'll, we'll get it that way for you. We're just conscious of the time. Uh, so with that in mind, then, our next speaker is uh, Ricky Stanland. Thank you very much. Is it working? Yeah, good. Um, thanks for having me today. Um, just a disclaimer, I, I sound full of a cold, and it is a cold. I've had multiple negative PCRs and natural flows. Um, I guess I wanted to start really and just say that actually I'm no expert in interpreting blood tests. Um, I'm sure there may be some people that are far more experienced in doing that here today. But what I wanted to share really was my, I guess, my learning curve, the steep learning curve that I think we all have been on throughout primary care and working in general practice in interpreting blood tests and data. Um, so by background, I'm a physician associate. Prior to that, um, I did my undergraduate in biochemistry and my master's in that. And then I taught for a couple of years as well. So I, it's kind of how I've got involved with the training hub. Um, do I have, does this clicker work for me, Liam? There we go. So, is it working now? Do you want me to stay there? Okay. So just for the contents of today then, so we're going to look at data interpretation and a starting point with it. We're then going to look at the importance of the trend within blood tests. We'll look at a few case studies. So I've put, four, put together four different case studies. One's on the full blood count, one's on UNEs, one's on liver function tests. I'll be okay here. Thank you. Um, and then the last one is pulling it all together. I'm mindful of the audiences um, of lots of different professionals, um, some of which may be very um, early in their careers in general practice. So what I've tried to do is put together four case studies that may sort of bridge between chronic disease, acute presentations that we may see either as GPs, PAs, ACPs or practice nurses or even other professionals within primary care. So just to get started then, um, I think it can often feel quite overwhelming when you're presented with a results box that's got potentially over 40 results in and you're thinking, oh gosh, how am I going to get through these safely? Um, and I think I just try and remind myself that the stepwise approach to get, getting through them. Um, first of all, I always think of it as a case note review. So what does that mean? Well, a cursory glance at, of course, the, the age and the sex of the patient first and foremost. Um, Perhaps the patient's well known to you, and ideally you will have requested those blood tests, but as we all know in primary care with shortages of staff, it's not always the case, and unfortunately you may be presented with blood tests that um, you've not requested yourself. What's the background and the past medical history of the patient? And again, this can just be a cursory look. This doesn't need to be an in-depth look at, the, at this particular patient, but it's always good just to have a cursory glance at what that is. Glance at the current medications and consider the importance in respect of the data. It, of course, if we're looking at UNEs, for example, if we're seeing lots of diuretics, then we, we need to see in the context of what, what we're looking at, really. What's the linked consultation and or indication for the blood test? So, of course, look, when were, when were the bloods re requested, who by, and what for? Um, just to give us a good idea of what we might be interpreting in the context of. So in, in, the, in, sort of, in view of the cases that we go through today, if we can sort of ask ourselves these questions, and I've kind of threaded them throughout, so hopefully they'll be apparent throughout as well. And then finally, just the annual review process uh, for monitoring purposes versus diagnostic blood. So it's important we identify which it is. We're probably all aware of the fact that there have been shortages of, of tubes recently, so we may have been pushed more for sort of urgent bloods, but it's difficult at the best of times. So important to identify, is this for monitoring purposes and have we found something incidental or is this something that we found through actually looking for it? So to start with the trend then, um, <clears throat> I guess how many times as clinicians do we request repeats, and I think we're all guilty of this, um, particularly maybe with some blood tests more than others. Um, the real important question here that I always ask myself is, me, if I request a repeat for this blood test, is it really going to change the clinical management for the patient and or inform what my next steps may be? So can we think of particular examples that we may ask to be repeated in days, weeks, months, for example? If anyone could just shout some out, really, for examples for us. You and E's, yeah. Thyroid function, LFTs, full blood count, yeah. So thinking more specifically though, we may trend things like our CRP. We may find that we've got a mildly raised CRP, but we want to see that in time that's coming down. And again, it's thinking about what is a realistic period of time that we want to repeat that within. 
Our GFR, we may find that there's a transient drop in the GFR, which may be indicative of just their fluid status, they were dehydrated on the day, it may be that there's actually, they've not had blood tests for, 60, for 18 months and there may be some CKD going on in the background. ALT, now there's a number of different causes of what we may see a transient rise in an ALT and we'll look at that as part of the case study today. Potassium, the nightmare that is, because often it's just a hemolyzed sample most of the time, but of course we get those and we need them repeated urgently. Often we might send them to A&E, they'll have a quick repeat and be sent home. For anyone that works in out of hours, you probably come across that quite often from bloods that are done in the day. And HbA1c, of course, we repeat quite frequently. So I think it's probably one of the most powerful things we can do as part of interpreting blood tests in terms of looking at what is the trend, what's the patient's baseline, and how is it deviating from that baseline. Is it stable, is it uptrending, or is it downtrending? And from that we can get a lot of reassurance and or uh, evidence to actually be concerned about what we're seeing. Equally, um, reassurance to patients. So it's not always necessarily a matter of interpreting it for the likes of data but actually reassuring patients that changes that they may have made may actually be being seen and what we're seeing so for example HbA1c's once patients understand what they are it can be really reassuring and it can be goal setting for them as well so it's really important that where possible we share this data with patients and use the graphs and trends to be able to help them to understand what progress they're making so case study one then on the full blood count we have a 57 year old lady that presents to her GP with increased tiredness She's noted to have Graves' disease, but otherwise has no significant past medical history of note. We carried out a full blood count with hematinics. So often we will probably refer to it as sort of a TAT screen, so tiredness all the time. We'll do full blood count with hematinics. Some people may not do hematinics from the offset. I personally do. Um, TFTs came back <coughs> in normal, in range with a normal TSH and T4. Um, so of course, with the background of Graves' disease, we'd want to make sure they're euthymic at that point. However, the HB came back at 99, which was a drop from 134. So again, we're already seeing that the first thing we need to look at is the, in the context of what the previous was, regardless of when that was. But it's always important to ask yourself, when was the previous? Was it three months ago? Was it a year ago? Was it two years ago? And I think we're probably all coming across patients now who may have not had bloods for two years. So it's really important to think about the implications of that. The MCV is 106. So that's raised. The full blood count is otherwise in normal range. The serum ions normal, the ferritin's normal, the folate's normal, the B12's low. So is anyone able to have a think about what we're seeing in the context of this particular case? So we've got a B12 deficiency, good. And do we think that's what's causing the anemia? So we've got an anemia with a low B12 and a raised MCV, so we've got a macrocytic anemia. So the most likely cause is a B12. What are we going to do next though? Remember this patient's presented with increased tiredness. Check intrinsic factor. Yeah, we could check intrinsic factor, perfect. And why would you check that, Claire? Uh, because if it's positive, then you need to give an iron injection, so it's negative. Yeah, perfect. So we need to do some additional blood tests, don't we, at this point? We need to work out why is the B12 low, and we said intrinsic factor, so we probably want to look at autoantibodies to intrinsic factor and antiparietal cell antibodies, really, for a diagnosis of pernicious anemia, of course, yeah. So we carry out those, and they're positive. What's the diagnosis? Well, we've said pernicious anemia. And again, just thinking about pulling all the context together, why is it important to look at that background, the past medical history? Perhaps at first we thought the tiredness may have been related to the fact that they had Graves' disease, perhaps they weren't, um, the Graves' disease wasn't well controlled, but the TFTs were normal. However, just as a bit of a side point really, is just remembering that if anyone has any one autoimmune disease, they're predisposed to having another. Um, good, so just pulling things together then. So, um, in terms of full blood count, I'm sure we all have our guidance, our pathways. Our, I personally use the Camden CCG pathway. I think the slides will go out to you so you'll be able to see them. I, I appreciate you can't see it very clearly on this, but it quite simply just allows you to work through any full blood count abnormality in a, in a nice logarithmic way following the pathway. If there's an anemia present that's new, utilising the MCV as the first piece of the puzzle, is it microcytic, normocytic, macrocytic? and then working out the appropriate management from that. So I guess my take home here is 
whilst it's good to know these things and over time you'll generate pattern recognition of doing it, but not to underestimate in the early phase of just utilising these pathways and resources so that you can build up that confidence in a well-evidenced based way. Um, and then the mnemonic that I really like for a macrocytic anemia, so that's a, ne a new anemia with a raised MCV, is a fat red blood cell. So we have F for fetus, so pregnancy. We've got A for alcohol, T for thyroid, and that's hypothyroidism. So in the context of um, Graves' disease, we wouldn't necessarily see that unless they were under-replaced. Um, retic reticulocytosis, so that's just immature red blood cells being produced, usually as a process of hemolysis in the background. B12 and folate deficiency, which is the most common deficiencies we will see in general practice. And cirrhosis and chronic liver disease, again, not something that we, we, we it's not uncommon, I guess, in general practice. Um, I know we're often swamped by mnemonics within medicine, but actually the odd few I do find really useful, and this one I like quite like for interpretation of blood. Okay, so case study two then. Um, we've got a 79-year-old gentleman who's presented for his annual review. He has a background of type 2 diabetes, hypertension, previous MI, and CKD. So quite a lot going on, quite high from a CV point, high risk from a CV point of view. You come across the results of his renal function, which prompts review of his notes. His GFR is 46 from 54 six months earlier. His HbA1c is 43. His full blood count reveals a new microcytic anemia. And what's the most common cause of a microcytic anemia? Iron deficiency is what we want to rule out first and foremost, isn't it? Because that could be a background, there could be an underlying malignancy or something sinister. Um, absolutely. So we need to have that in the back of our mind. So we're probably looking at there a hate, drop in HB, a low ferritin. Normal bone profile and liver function tests. He takes metformin one gram twice a day with some citagliptin, clicloside and atorvastatin. His BP is 128 over 67. His BMI is 21 and 6 and six months earlier it was 23, so there's, there's a reduction in his weight there. His ACR is too high to measure, and his PCR is 1.9. So our ACR, for those of us that may not be aware, is albumin-creatinine ratio, so we're looking for end organ damage within the kidneys, secondary to diabetes or hypertension, most commonly. It's too high to measure, so we then look to a protein-creatinine ratio, and actually that gives us it 1.9, so it's much higher than we'd like. His cholesterol is 7.6. What are your next steps? Complex case, but anyone got any thoughts on? Pardon? Yeah, so he's got a new microcytic anemia, so we absolutely want to check ferritin. Is he losing blood from somewhere? Is that what's causing it? Yeah, good. Fit test wouldn't be yep. Yeah, exactly. We want to probe a little bit more about that weight loss. Is that intentional or is that unintentional? You know, we've got someone that generally, from a bit hypertension and diabetes point of view, is doing okay. So perhaps he's lost that weight intentionally. We need to find out a bit more, don't we? So we need some clinical correlation. Sorry, did someone over there? We'll assume they're normal. Mm, so he's got normal creatinine, normal potassium, sodium, and urea. Fit test, yeah, of course. Good. Yeah, I want to do yep, yeah, urine dip for hematuria. Electrophoresis, and why would we do electrophoresis? Pardon? Because of the anemia? Yeah. So you call the patient. So first and foremost, call the patient. Let's see what's going on. Let's get some clinical correlation. Is there something that's going on here? Remember, these were for monitoring purposes, they weren't for diagnostic purposes, so we need to find out a little bit more. So you call to review the patient, and they say they've not been feeling too well, and the only thing that's particularly changed is some atraumatic worsening lower back pain. So they're known to have lower back pain, it's getting worse, they've not had any evidence of trauma. Electrophoresis, yeah, I think we're starting to now think along the lines of... Yeah, so my, I can hear some myeloma in the background, absolutely. So we're looking in the context of... Um, a 79 year old that's got atraumatic, so he's got bony pain, atraumatic bony pain really, actually, and he's got some features that might be consistent with myeloma. He does report some subjective weight loss, but 
puts that down to eating better generally after going on some recent diabetes education. This is where things get, get a little bit more difficult, isn't it? It's actually, in reality, sometimes it's not so easy to find out if this is intentional or unintentional weight loss. Sometimes it's difficult to be able to decipher. Um, he's actively trying to lose weight, but is, is there a process that's driving that in the background? He does not report any measured hypos. And the reason I've, why have I put that about the hypos? So if we go back to here. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So red flag here is he's on glycoside. We know glycoside causes hypos. HB of 43 is quite low. HbA1c is quite low for, for that with glycoside. So certainly with someone non-specifically unwell or maybe not feeling themselves, I'd want to make sure they're not having any hypos and that they're testing. Um, remember that hypos with glycoside are deeper and longer than that of insulin. So actually we need to just be mindful that they can feel quite unwell atypically with it as well. Good. He does not report any measured hypos, so that's good. He agrees to have bloods for immunoglobulins, electrophoresis and urine Benz Jones, which is what we essentially um, picked up on, is we need to be thinking about multiple myeloma, so bone marrow um, malignancy, really. So he's got a new iron deficiency anemia, he has reduced GFR, and he has um, some atraumatic worsening back pain at an advanced age, really, which is quite uncommon and a red flag in itself, isn't it? I know I'm probably, there's probably a few MSK or FCPs within here that, certainly know that atraumatic lower back pain in the context of this would need a, a myeloma screen, really. Um, good. And interestingly, I guess, what is a good point to pick up on is nationally ACR, so the, the, the ACR for diabetic monitoring is poorly uptaken. So this was incidental based on that to some extent. If that wasn't picked up, it could have easily been missed in terms of we could have easily perhaps repeated those UNEs and and not done a great deal about it and said, oh, this is diabetic kidney disease or um, CKD because there's nothing else that we can see. But, so it's important that where possible we do try to get those. And after, after haematology follow-up, after we did our serum uh, immunoglobulins, um, electrophoresis and urine Burns jones who was diagnosed with multiple myeloma. What's really important, I, I think, to just highlight here is when we go back to this case, um, his diabetes and hypertension is well controlled. So we shouldn't be seeing an ACR that is unmeasurable. I guess that's a red flag in itself. If he, if he had a HbA1c that was above 100 and poorly controlled hypertension, it would be more believable. But always remember that, are we, is this in the context of their long-term condition and their control of that? If it's out of keep, then actually we need to think about outside the box. Um, have, we, have we sort of thought about other pathologies that could be causing this? And this is just a reminder from a chronic kidney disease point of view, 70% of chronic kidney disease is secondary to hypertension and type 2 diabetes. So majority of it, common is common, and that's what we'll see most of the time. But again, just to remind yourself, if you're seeing something that's not in keeping with their hypertension or diabetes, it should raise red flags. We don't need to know the answers right here and now, but we probably need to think about having that discussion with your team or your supervisor or thinking about what are the next steps to make sure we can understand why this patient's renal function is declining, and he's uh, got severe microbial in it. I use this chart quite often. Most of you will probably come across it, so we want to think about sort of when we're looking at UNEs, particularly from a CKD point of view, looking at the GFR in the context of the albumin-creatinine ratio and RAG rating it, um, and it gives us a good idea, really, of the risk of decline of that patient. So certainly for our general practice nurses, I think most of them will probably be aware of it and hopefully use use this, but it gives us a good idea of what's the risk of decline in terms of that. Um, good. And I guess just on the back of that as well, that, you know, there's, we always talk about ACE inhibitors as being renoprotective medicines, but they're not standalone, they're the only renoprotective medicines now, and SGLT2s um, are also renoprotective. So in terms of looking at preventing the decline, particularly for those in that red bracket, we do have multiple options. We, some of you may have come across dapagliflozin, which only last week got a license to be used down to a GFR of 15. So we can use it all the way down to 15 with or without diabetes now. So medicines are evolving for, for CKD. And just another mnemonic for multiple myeloma, something that can quite easily be missed, but sort of the crab mnemonic. So not all will present with hypercalcemia, but certainly those that do present with kidney stones at a later age usually would generally have a workup and assessment for that. Um, renal insufficiency, which is what we've seen in this context. Anemia, which we saw with our microcytic anemia. Um, and then punched out osteolytic bone lesions. What we saw in this case was the presentation of this lower back pain. 
majority of people suffer throughout their life with lower back pain. Some may be chronic, some may be acute. We just need to be mindful of the fact that when we're talking about this sort of age bracket, we're, we're mindful of the fact that there's other processes that could be going on. Great, how am I doing for time? So, case study three then. So, um, you review the bloods of a 48-year-old gentleman who has the following liver function tests. Um, he has an ALT of 76, so the ALT is raised. The liver function tests otherwise are actually okay. They're normal. So the ALP is in normal range, the bilirubin's in normal range, the albumin's in normal range. I know for a lot of people, and certainly took me more time to get used to liver function tests and interpreting them, and, and actually they're still the bane of my life now because I think we all approach them slightly differently and probably request repeats more so than we should without actually doing the most appropriate thing for our, for our patients. You trend the ALT and notice it's been persistently raised for the past six months. Frequently there's been repeats requested and no clinical correlation has been gained. Their bloods are otherwise unremarkable except they've got a HbA1c of 112. Um, I feel like this is now becoming more than normal with these HbA1c's so high. I once would have been shocked with that but I feel that they're becoming more and more. <laughs> the higher the baseline is just going up. The bloods were carried out for a routine annual review so this is incidental. You review their notes and they have a background of type 2 diabetes, hypertension and obesity. So, you discuss, so we need some clinical correlation, we need to have a bit of a chat with the patient now. I think there comes a point where we've repeated them so much so and now we just need to find a little bit more about from the patient. You discuss the results with the patient and they report no abdominal pain, no GI symptoms of note generally. They drink a glass of wine on occasion. Um, just a thought on the side of that from a data interpretation, but what biochemical markers might we be able to see in the context of alcoholic GDT and MCB? So thinking back to our fat red blood cell, alcohol being in the fat. So actually, you can definitely tell some of your patients that are alcohol dependent when they have their bloods under alcohol services, perhaps they're being sort of monitored for the GGT, trending the GGT, trending the MCV. Um, good. No history of IVDU or tattoos abroad. What are we thinking about in terms of that? Why might we ask these questions? Yeah, of course. So we want to yeah, look for risk of hepatitis. Long-term monogamous relationship with female. I think sometimes it can be quite difficult to have these conversations, but it's really important, particularly within our MSM population, so males who have sex with males, we need to be screening for hepatitis, and we need to be asking these questions. If they are in a relationship, is it monogamous? Is there sex outside of that? Is it protected? So we've asked these questions, we've got a little bit of clinical correlation. Um, next steps. Liver screen, perfect. So we repeat with an AST, GGT, and a full liver screen, and we refer for a liver ultrasound. I appreciate not all this usually would happen at the same, any, any same time. We might do this in a stepwise sequential approach. We do a liver screen to include hepatitis C, hepatitis B. We look. We, look, we do ferritin, we do iron studies, we do ferritin for hematochromatosis, um, iron studies, ceruloplasmin for Wilson's, perfect, immunoglobulins, alpha-1 antitrypsin for, for its deficiency, and autoantibodies for any autoimmune hepatitis that we might see. Liver screen comes back negative. Liver ultrasound shows some evidence of NAFLD. So we knew that they're type 2 diabetes, hypertension, obese. So probably from the offset, you could probably put, after they said no to alcohol, probably would, common is common, NAFLD would probably be the most common thing second to that, wouldn't it? But what do we do with that? Before, perfect, yeah, so good. So we might want to look, start looking at risk stratification because the complications of NAFLD long-term are, yeah, uh, eventually cirrhosis, so NASH, so non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, and then cirrhosis. So we need to look at risk stratifying them for that. I'm not sure we do it so well. I feel like we get the ultrasound, we confirm it's NAFLD, and then we probably just continue to repeat their LFTs um, throughout. We need to then obviously look to see whether they need a fibro scan, really, with that FIB4 score. Um, so the FIB4 score is 1.73, which is based on these four factors, which is age, ALT, AST, platelets. In my locality in Salford, AST is not routinely done as part of LFT, so it's an additional 
LFT, which I think probably is similar to most places. So it's really important to be able to do a Fib4 score, you need to request the AST in addition to the ALT. Um, and then it's a really simple calculation. You plug the numbers in and you get a Fib4 score, which tells you where you're going and what you're doing with them. Based on the Fib4 score, we should request ELF test and the gastro. So again, you may have services in primary care to do fibre scans in the community. It may be that you need to refer them to your specialist services or secondary care to get that. Um, Alongside, we of course need to consider CVD risk and optimization, and that's the most important thing I think we can do here is, whilst there's not a great deal we can do necessarily to reduce the risk of fibrosis, but what we need to do is optimize the other CV risk factors to essentially look after that and reduce the all-cause mortality secondary to CV. Pathway, again, um, for those of you that may not feel so confident, um, I'll include it all in the slides, but this is an LFT pathway. It pretty much will walk you through how to approach abnormal deranged LFTs in primary care. This is not specific to GM, although I know that Dr. Robinson at Salford Royal and some of the hepatologists are looking at a GM-specific one for us to follow for, for the likes of abnormal LFTs and what we need to do in primary care. Um, you can see in the middle arm of that, which is the most common one we're going to see, is that chronically mildly hepatitic picture raised ALT but less than 300, we follow the process we just did. We then end up with a, possibly a diagnosis of fatty liver as we did in this case. Um, and again, we have a nice logarithm to follow, which generally is once confirmed on ultrasound, we do a Fib4 score, we know where we're going and what we're doing. In the bottom corner, you can see, which is probably what we do majority of the time in practice, but we need to consider things like cholesterol. This patient's cholesterol was raised if they're not on a statin, then they need to have a acute risk for a statin. Um, if they are on a statin, are they on the appropriate dose? So if they've got a history of an MI, are they on secondary prevention or are they on primary prevention still? Quite often we'll come across patients that are on 20 milligrams of atorvastatin when actually they should be on 80 really, um, provided they can tolerate. Also, obviously, considering this patient's diabetes is horrendously controlled, um, they're not on insulin, but probably need to be on insulin or under some DSNs really for that. So thinking about that, hypertension, weight loss. And realistically, that's what all we can do, apart from continuing to reevaluate the risk of, of, of cirrhosis and NASH, um, is essentially try and optimize those cardiovascular risk factors. Um, good. Finally then, I think we've got about five minutes. Um, case study four. Um, so this one pulls things together a little bit. So we have a 56-year-old Maureen Smith, she attends for a GP appointment, complaining of increased thirst, passing excessive urine, with an excruciating itch across her body. She reports feeling tired all the time. She's also incidentally lost eight kilograms in the last three months. She isn't well known to a GP, having had no bloods in recent years. She's got no long-term conditions of note. Some of you are probably already thinking of the diagnosis already, just from that, that those, that perfect presenting complaint. And, but we do a set of bloods. We do a set of full, we do a full blood count, you and LFTs, TFTs, bone profile, and a HbA1c. The Hb comes back at 105 with a low MCV and a low ferritin. Otherwise, the hematinics are okay. So that's a microcytic or an iron deficiency anemia. Perfect. Again, concerning in the context of what we're seeing. GFR is 62, was previously 83. Normal potassium, normal sodium, normal urea and normal creatinine. We see those liver function tests. She's got a very high ALP, very high GGT, raised bilirubin, with a normal ALT and a normal albumin. If we think previously, so when we looked at our LFTs previously, we looked at t the other picture. So we've got that hepatitic, that inflammatory picture versus this picture, which is our obstructive picture. Um, we're seeing the ALP and the GGT raised with the bilirubin. There's something blocking the liver, isn't there? The HbA1c is 98 from 38 previously. Bloods are otherwise unremarkable, but there's enough wrong there, isn't there, to... Yeah. What's your interpretation? What's your next steps?
Did I hear a two week wait? Yeah. So it's a two week wait. Good, yeah. I'd be, yeah, I'd be surprised if you didn't. So there's certainly a question to ask about is this patient acutely unwell or are they well enough to keep at home and actually we do a two week wait? And of course that needs to be assessed, doesn't it? Um, They've got a microcytic anemia though, which we need to think about in the context of malignancy, of course, again. So I'm reminding you that actually this microcytic anemia, the new iron deficiencies anemia, we need to make sure we don't, we don't miss them. Obstructive LFTs, is there a hepatobiliary obstruction? But then the final bit is the, the essentially the, the new onset of diabetes um, in the context of what we're seeing, which is an obstructive liver picture um, and an iron deficiency anemia. Is, is pancreatic cancer until proven otherwise? And this was a case that actually presented to me about six months ago, but it's not been the only one that I've heard of in primary care, and I'm sure most experienced clinicians in the room will have come across this. The general pruritus, the generalised itchiness, actually, was probably the bilirubin, really. She did present jaundice anyway from the offset, which gives you the clue, really, doesn't it? But nonetheless, sometimes they don't present with um, sort of generalised jaundice. But actually sometimes just worth thinking about, particularly with those patients that perhaps are a new onset of diabetes, just screening for those upper GI symptoms. Is there other things that might explain it? Poorly controlled diabetes may lead to weight loss, but it doesn't necessarily always mean that that weight loss is secondary to diabetes, is it? That actually is a process that explains the diabetes and the weight loss. So it's worth thinking about. So this patient needs a two week wait for uh, hepatobiliary um, ultimately, unless they need admission prior to that. Um, so final thoughts to finish then. Um, again, just thinking about all the time really when you come across blood tests, what was the indication and what's the link to consultation? Review the background of the patient, look for risk factors that might indicate or might raise your sort of concerns and alarms a little bit more. If we are repeating, is it really going to inform it or what if, if we are repeating, is there something in addition we might want to do? If we're repeating the LFTs, why don't we add an AST if we are thinking it's NAFL just so we can start to then think about a FIB4 score is not specific to NAFL, but we use it in the context of chronic hepatitis, um, alcoholic liver disease. It's a score that allows you to risk stratify the risk of cirrhosis, not necessarily specific just to um, NAFL. So it's really important if we are doing repeats of LFTs, it's worthwhile getting that. What is the trend? So I'm always thinking about what was the previous reading, when was that previous reading? Do we need clinical correlation? Do we need to give them a quick call? I think. For those of you that probably work, worked in hospitals, the amount of times you've probably come across CRPs through the roof, you've been to see the patient and they're actually really well sat up in bed or, or vice versa. You, sometimes they're just not in keeping, so it's really worthwhile thinking, do I need to pick up the phone and have a chat with this patient or can it wait? And we don't need to know all the answers, it's particularly for those of us that are new to primary care, it is a steep learning curve. You will get better with pattern recognition. Um, work as part of your teams, ask questions, do things in a safe, supervised way so that actually you can develop your confidence and competency over time. Um, and there are so many guidance out there. Of course, guidance is, you know, is, is there to guide us. It's not black and white, but utilize it. Find something that works for you. And make sure really, above all, that your team perhaps using the same. I know we came as a practice together to decide which LFT pathway are we going to agree on because everyone was repeating at different intervals. It makes things difficult when you're coming in at different periods of time and everyone's, you're trying to piece together what someone's done prior to your input. Thank you, and any questions? <laughs>